If you've got a Bible, go ahead and flip it open to Ephesians uh, 5. We're going to start in verse 21 here in a minute. Uh, we're starting a new mini-series through our kind of big series through Ephesians this morning. Uh, we're calling it Family Matters uh, because family matters. And uh, the destruction of the family is like rampant right now. You, you look in the country and the family unit is just being destroyed in America uh, because I believe many of us have given up biblical authority in our lives. Uh, a 2017 Gallup poll, and, and I can only imagine that things have gotten worse. These, these were just the best statistics I could find. Uh, a 2017 poll discovered that only 24% of Americans believed that the Bible was the actual word of God and that we should take it literally in our lives. Like we should read it, what it says, and believe that it's the actual words of God and as the actual words of God, we should take them literally and act upon them in our lives. Only 24% of people, like less than a fourth of Americans in 2017 believe that. We've been taught since the mid-1800s that we're all animals. We've started to act like it. Just look outside. You know, we've been taught that God didn't create the world. And we've bought into that lie. And, and sadly, that's true even for people in the church. Our, our kids were visiting some of their family this, this past week, and uh, they were having a conversation in the car, and one of them said, hey, we all, we all come from animals. Like, we, we come from apes and all that stuff. And Addie's like, no, that's not true. We, we don't come from apes. And this is, she's talking to somebody who's been brought up in a ministry family. Like, this, this lie is rampant even in the church. Only 24% of Americans even believe that the Bible is the actual word of God and that we should take it literally. We've been taught, our culture teaches us that it's all about us, what we want, what we need, what we feel like doing, and we've bought into that lie too. But that's the opposite of the way God designed this whole thing to be. You know, we've been going through Ephesians the last couple of months, and lately we've been talking about what maturity in the life of a Christ follower looks like. And now Paul's going to move on to the realm of what it looks like in family relationships. Uh, this morning we're going to talk about husbands and wives, and then over the next few weeks we're going to talk specifically about children and parents. We're talking about the role of fathers and, 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 and what it means to be a, a godly father. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, the relationships between slaves and masters. Like That, that one should be fun here, here in a few weeks. But first... We're going to talk about husbands and wives. And it would be true if I said many marriages end in divorce. According to researchers, it's about 33% of all marriages, give or take, will end in divorce. Now, you can't argue with statistics. That, that, that's true. So basically, a third of all marriages will end in divorce statistically. The state of Oklahoma has the fourth highest amount of divorces in the nation. We're right behind Nevada, Arkansas, and West Virginia. And those who live together before they get married, depending on what you read, it's either 40% or 49%, a high number. Those who live together before they get married are 40% or 49% more likely to get a divorce than couples who do not live together before they get married. And it seems like some of the top reasons that people get divorced are lack of commitment, infidelity, too much arguing in the marriage. Uh, they got married too young and had unrealistic expectations. And while I don't deny those basic reasons at all, I'm going to argue this morning that much of what we are seeing when it comes to the breakdown of the family is a direct result of us abandoning the truth of the Word of God in our lives over the years. The text that we're going to look at this morning is not a popular text in the world in which we find ourselves. In fact, many will call it hate speech, they'll call it discriminatory, they'll say it elevates men and stomps on women, uh, they'll say it's outdated, it reflects this society where, where women were only treated like property, and in our culture where radical feminism is being preached from every street corner, what Paul writes in Ephesians is completely countercultural. But let me say this, just because something is countercultural doesn't mean it's not true. And if, if a look at our culture is any indication, we might not want to follow the culture because it, it doesn't seem to be going anyplace good right now. 
And we need to decide whether we're going to listen to our culture or whether we're going to listen to the word of God in our lives. See, one of the most popular sayings that I keep hearing right now is, Man, we got we to be on the right side of history. Folks, if our dumpster fire of a culture says anything right now, we are not. We are on the wrong, or we, we're not on the right side of history. This country was founded upon the truth of Scripture. Now, we, we can argue whether some of our founding fathers were, were great Christians or not, but you can't deny the centrality that Scripture placed in the founding of America, the impact that it had on the founding of this country. I don't know if you've noticed, but while many Confederate statues are being torn down everywhere, and, and the president's having to sign executive orders to make sure you know, no, no other national monuments get torn down, some have made it known that the statues of Jesus, white statues of Jesus that depict Jesus as a Caucasian male, those statues are going to be coming down next because a white Jesus is oppressive. A white Caucasian Jesus makes me feel uncomfortable. He's a, a symptom of what's wrong with everything. This won't end until the very fabric of our society is just torn apart. And yet, as we're going to talk about in a month, our fight is not against flesh and blood. You know, your enemy isn't the Democrat who believes the opposite of everything that you believe. And your enemy isn't the Republican who believes the opposite of everything that you believe. You know, your, your, your enemy isn't the police officer. Your, your enemy isn't the person of a different ethnicity. Your enemy is not the person who's protesting in the street. And your enemy is not, isn't the person who's choosing to sit at home and not do any of that. Until we realize who the real enemy is, we're, we're going to be fighting each other. And, and that's exactly what he wants. But that's, that's a topic for another series we'll get to in a few weeks. But the teaching that we're going to look at this morning is not popular because it's not understood. And it's not understood because we've completely abandoned the truth and the centrality of God in our culture, and it's so apparent. So before we get to Ephesians 5.21, I, you know, I need to briefly remind the, um, us of the context. And Paul's talking about how what he's about to talk about, what he's been talking about, maturity and all this, it's not possible without the Holy Spirit in our lives. It's not possible without the Holy Spirit guiding us and living inside of us, changing us from the inside out. That that's what makes this new and this countercultural life that he's going to talk about possible. It's not about trying harder. It's not about, hey, do these seven steps and your life will be so much better. That, that's not what he's talking about at all. He's talking about following the leading of the Holy Spirit. So Ephesians 5, uh, verse 21, set, starts out saying this. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And it's like, oh, snap. He just said the S word in church. We, we don't like that word, submit. There's, there's just something about it. It's almost like a cuss word. Now, before we really talk about this word, I, I want to look at how it shows up in the rest of Scripture. This isn't an exhaustive list. It's mainly just some highlights that I picked out where the same word shows up in the Greek. You know, in Luke 2.51, it says Jesus submitted to his parents. Luke 10.17 says demons submitted to Jesus or into the apostles. In Romans 8, 7, it says the, the sinful mind doesn't submit to the law of God. In Romans 8, 20, it says creation submits. Romans 13, 1, it says, hey, be in submission to the governing authorities. Ephesians 5, 24, which we'll talk about in a minute, the church submits to Christ. James 4, 7 talks about submitting to God. 1 Peter 2, 13, it talks about submitting to governing authorities. 1 Peter 5, 5, it says, Churches submit themselves to the elders. The context of submission is all over Scripture. It's not, it's not just this word or this idea or this principle that's found in Ephesians 5. You can make the case that submission is one of the most common traits in all of our lives as we follow Christ. But what does it mean? What, what, what does submit mean? Why, why does it have such a bad taste in my mouth? At its most basic, submit is a military term. It's a term that denotes that we're all under a certain rank and that there are other people who are of a different rank. You know, in the military, there's many different rankings, and it's fair to say that a private is not given the same respect as a general, right? In my military people, they agree with that. 
while they're completely equal in terms of personhood, in the sense that, hey, God, God created them. They're both created in the image of God, so they're equal as people. They're not completely equal in terms of position. Private submit to the orders and to the will of the general and not the other way around. You, you don't see the privates commanding the general and the, and the general responding to the orders of the private. It's, it's flip-flopped. The military is designed to break down the will of an individual so that they can rebuild them as a collective unit to where it's not so much about me as it is about us. Submit is this positional word. So, so what's Paul talking about in Ephesians 5.21? See, before he brings up any specific family group inside of the church, he, he starts by talking about the church itself. And he says to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And he doesn't just say submit to one another. Like, he doesn't just leave it at that and put a period at the end of one another. He says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. You know, those last five words are really important. In submitting to one another, we're really and we're truly submitting to Christ. But what's that look like in the church? You know, it's the opposite of it's all about me. It's the opposite of, man, we've got to do what I want to do because I want to do it and my idea is better than yours. It's the opposite of that. Instead of fighting and scheming to, to get our own way, we submit ourselves to each other. Or, maybe we can say it this way, we consider others in the church to be of a higher position than, than we ourselves are in. We willingly position ourselves under them. This is not a forced thing. It's completely voluntary. It's, it's me saying that you're more important than I am, and I'm going to treat you that way. It's not me saying that I'm not valuable. Like, don't hear that. I'm not saying I'm not valuable. It's me saying that I'm going to consider you and I'm going to treat you as more valuable than I consider myself. And it's only out of our reverence or our awe, our fear, our respect, that's kind of what that word means, for Christ that we're able to do this. Now, just for a second, I just want you to imagine what, what a church would be like if everyone decided to adopt that attitude. You know, this attitude that says, whatever happens, I'm, I'm going to consider that you are more valuable than I am. I'm going to get myself out of the way so that, so, that you can, so that you can feel important. See, when, it, when it's not about me, it's about us. Something tells me if, if people adopted that attitude, there'd be much fewer churches splitting over the color of carpet and where you put the pulpit on the stage and any other kind of stupid reason. So before he moves into family units, Paul first outlines what submission looks like for everyone in the church. No one is exempt from submission, and it's only once he teaches that that he moves on to husbands and wives. Verse 22 says, Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. So to follow his train of thought, everyone submits. He then goes on to describe how that submission looks like in different familial, if that's a word, relationships. He says, wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. We already talked a little bit about what submission means. It's just this voluntary acknowledgement and positioning of myself under someone else. It's completely voluntary. Is Paul saying that husbands are more important than wives? No, he's not. What Paul is saying is that men and, we, men and women are completely equal in terms of personhood, but within a marriage, they're not completely equal in terms of position. See, God has designed men to lead their families. This, does, this doesn't say that women are supposed to submit themselves to every man. It says Submit yourself to your own husband. This is submission to one man, not every man. And you might say, well, my wife wears the pants in my family. And that's only true if you haven't stepped up to lead. God designed men to lead, and when men don't lead, their wives will take over. They'll, they'll take their husband's God-given role, but that's not how God designed it. Wives should not be the spiritual leaders of your family's men. And there, there's this part in verse 22, and I think we forget when we talk about this verse. The world here, submit yourselves to your husbands. 
and thinks that it's proof of a male-driven society where, where men are just pigs and women have no rights. But, but look at the last words. It says, submit as you do to the Lord. There's this real sense that it's really not even your husband that you're submitting to, but, but it's the Lord. There's a very real sense that submission is much more about your relationship with God than it is about your relationship with your husband. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 3, uh, verses 1 through 6, uh, help us understand this a little better. I'm going to read this, and I want to key on a very specific part. He says, wives, in the same way, submit yourselves to your own husbands, so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives when they see the purity and reverence of your lives. Your beauty should not come from outward adornment, such as elaborate hairstyles and the wearing of gold jewelry or fine clothes. Rather, it should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. For this is the way the holy women of the past who put their hope in God used to adorn themselves. They submitted themselves to their own husbands, like Sarah, who obeyed Abraham and called him her Lord. You are her daughters if you do what is right and do not give way to fear. Now, when Peter says, in the same way, submit yourselves, he's, he's hearkening back to what he's just written about Jesus and how Jesus entrusted himself to God and he ultimately submitted to death. What, what we need to see is this overarching trust that in God that causes anyone to submit. This trust that says, God can take care of me when I submit to him and that God can deliver me when I submit to him, even if I don't want to do what I'm doing. Because remember, submission to a husband is more about submitting to God than to your husband. And it's telling that Peter brings up Sarah uh, as an example of submission to, to Abraham. Do, do you remember how Sarah submitted to Abraham? We don't talk about it a lot. And when we do, we, we, we kind of focus on, on, on one, one particular part of it that's not the, that isn't even really the point of it. But there's this passage in Genesis chapter 12, uh, starting in verse 10, where, where Abraham and Sarah, they travel to Egypt to live, and there's a famine going on, and Egypt has food, so they, they go to live there. And Abraham knows that Sarah is a very beautiful woman. And so he tells her, when they come into Egypt, I want you to tell Pharaoh that you are my sister instead of my wife, because if, you tell him that you're, if, if we tell him that you're my wife, then Pharaoh's going to come and kill me. And we're not going to make it out of this thing alive. So he says, Sarah, I want you to tell Pharaoh that you're my sister. And when we tell that story, what, what do we always pick up on? Oh, Abraham lied. That's not the point of that story. He did lie. He, he, was, he did use deception, but that, that's, that's not the point of that. So what happens is Pharaoh takes Sarah into his palace. He believes that her and Abraham are a brother and sister. He, he blesses Abraham Abraham acquires a lot of goods and a lot of wealth, and he takes Sarah into the palace as one of his own wives. And you know what that means, don't you? Like, Pharaoh treated Sarah as one of his own wives. And this was all Abraham's idea. And Sarah submits to him in this idea. How inconsiderate of an idea is that? That's like saying, hey, I want you to go, you know, let the president treat you as his wife. Like, that's the equivalent of what he's saying. Let Pharaoh treat you as his wife, because if we don't, I'm not going to make it out of this. So to save my own skin, I want you to do this for me. But watch how God delivers them out of Abraham's stupidity. The text says that God inflicts serious diseases on the Egyptians in, in Pharaoh's household until Pharaoh lets him go. And then... He lets him go with all the wealth that he's acquired uh, while he was in Egypt. And it's only through submission on Sarah's part to Abraham's terrible idea that Abraham learned firsthand how God could deliver them. I realize none of you have probably ever heard this before. But there's this very real sense that this concept of submission might be much more about experiencing God's deliverance in our lives than it is about anything else. You know, 1 Peter talks about, about wives and their unbelieving husbands and how their conduct can actually be this conduit for belief. And that's what we see in the life of Abraham. There's a sense that he didn't know the power of God or the deliverance of God until he had this stupid, crazy idea that, 
his wife submitted to, and then God just delivered them from it. That's what Peter's talking about. That's why he brings up Abraham and Sarah as an example of what it looks like to submit. If you're not quite sure what to think about of Abraham and Sarah in that story, you can think of Jesus. That's the example Peter used to kind of segue his way into this in the context. Just think about this for a minute. All right, Jesus, God in the flesh, willingly submitted himself to the will of sinful man. And he entrusted himself to God. This is the point that Peter's making before he talks about wives submitting to their husbands. You look at the Garden of Gethsemane, and Jesus is quite clear that he doesn't want to go to the cross. He said, if there's any other way for us to do this, then let's do it. But but then he says, it's not my will, but but yours. I'm going to follow your will. I'm going to put myself under your will and, and do what is best. And then they arrested him, and they beat him, and they put this crown of thorns on his head, and they crucified him, and they killed him. And at any moment, he could have called down thousands upon thousands of angels to save him. But he entrusted himself to someone else's will, even when he didn't want to. Even when he tried to think of something different. And look what happened. He died, yes. But three days later, God delivers him from death. Submission ultimately led to deliverance, even over death. And yet everything, everything in our culture fights against this concept of submission, especially within marriage. I don't want to submit. I I don't have to submit. You can't tell me what to do. I'm going to do what I want to do, and it doesn't matter what you think. It's about me. That's a stupid idea. I'm not going along with that. You're an idiot. And I would just be willing to bet right now that a lot of irreconcilable differences that are listed as the reason for divorces are nothing more than I just wanted to do what I wanted to do and it didn't matter what anyone else thought. Remember, submission willingly puts someone else's will and wants above my own. But if we, if we took this concept of submission biblically and, and we considered the fact that when wives submit to their husbands stupid ideas and they ultimately put their trust in God over their husbands, I believe we would be amazed at how we'd witness God deliver us from our stupid and even our sinful decisions. See, the world thinks submission means, woman, get, get back in the kitchen. You know, cook me my food. Bring me my drink. Do this. Do that. And that's the farthest thing from what Scripture actually teaches Read on what he says in Ephesians 5, verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church, without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for it for their body, just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and will be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you must also love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. So instead of acting like much of the world assumes we act, Paul instructs husbands to love their wives. And not just to love their wives, but to love them as Christ loved the church. He uses the word agape for love, which signifies this kind of unconditional kind of love, this this love that goes beyond sex, that goes beyond looks, that goes beyond friendship. This this love that says, whatever happens, I'm going to keep on loving you. It doesn't matter what you do, it doesn't matter what we go through, it doesn't matter what you look like, I'm going to keep on loving you. So how should husbands love their wives? Man, they should love them like Christ loved the church. And how did Christ love the church? Man, he, he sacrificed himself for the church. He died for the church. Oh man, if you're not sacrificing for your wife, you're not loving your wife biblically. If you're not leading her spiritually, you're not loving her biblically. You know, I don't care if you pay the bills and put the roof over the house and do all that. If you're not leading her closer to Jesus, 
you're failing in your role as a husband. It says in Philippians chapter 2, uh, verse 5, it says, In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. See, husbands should love their wives just like they treat their own body because they are one body. God joined them together. He took the flesh of two people and he made them one. That's what marriage is, the creation of one from two. And then Paul throws us for this loop like he so often does. He says, you know what? I'm, I'm not even talking about marriage anymore. I'm actually talking about the church this whole time. You know, God takes all of us from different backgrounds. He takes Jews, he takes Gentiles, and he makes us into one body, the church, of which he is the head. And the church submits to Christ. He's the authority for the church. And Paul's saying that God patterned marriage after the relationship that Christ would have with his church. Remember, the church was the plan even before the fall that's recorded in Genesis 3. And it's the church, he's already told us, that God uses to display his wisdom and his glory to the rulers and the authorities all up in the heavenly realms. There's this sense that marriage has never been about our happiness, but our holiness. That's partly why a third of marriages end in divorce. We want someone else to make us happy, but that was never the goal. That was never the purpose. God uses marriage to make us holy, and that's often not a fun process. He, he takes two people very different from each other, and he makes them into one flesh. And they learn to love each other, and they learn to serve each other. And the husband has his role, and the wife has her role, and if they both stay in their roles and they don't try to switch places, it's amazing what God can do. When, when people actually take the word of God seriously in their life, it's amazing what he can do. It, it's a picture of what God can do in the church as well. When we get rid of this idea that everything is about me, everything is about what I want and only what I want, no, everything's about the glory of God, whether it's in the church or whether it's in our marriage. And we can fight and we can claw our way against that. Or we can just submit ourselves to the fact that God knows what he's doing. And we can trust in the role that he's given us. Will you pray with me?